understand my background, I had come from uh, private law practice um, doing primarily plaintiff personal injury work, but also what you have to do when you're starting out in practice, taking over my father's law practice. Uh, and he'd been at it for 35 some odd years, and he passed away unexpectedly. And so all of a sudden I was instant lawyer. And so one of the things you find uh, as you go through the process you just start learning a lot about yourself and learning about what your interest level is and what you can do as an attorney. And um, I had several instances of uh, situations where I represented defendants in criminal cases involving sexual assault. And one of the things that had bothered me early, early on, I'm talking early 60s you now, uh, was the um, I don't want to. I don't want to be overly callous with this, but the somewhat indifferent attitude, uh, not only as mirrored in the county attorney's office, but also as uh, as the, the as the public looked at the issue of of uh, the victim in a in a sexual assault program, a sexual assault uh, situation, and and so having no desire to or any way to change that except through a legislative process. And it didn't give rise to, uh, you know, a passing a bill saying thou shalt not uh, treat victims uh, with, without some kind of uh, identification. Uh, it was one of those things that was sort of a, uh, an item that you couldn't do much about. So I thought, okay. So I, I, I was able to put together a coalition of of people to be nominated and, or excuse me, be appointed a county attorney. I resigned from the legislature the next day. I was appointed by two Democrats and one Republican on the county board. What year was that? 1973, for the, uh, July 19th, 1973. I had no problem uh, bringing in people who were smarter than I was and not stepping on people's toes and saying, I'm the boss, you do it my way. So I just decided, hey, for the next year, I better get my, my act together. One of my hang-ups was the, the, the attitude towards sexual assault victims, or at that time rape victims, was um, somebody makes it, flips a coin and makes a decision and says, we believe you, and we're going to go through with this thing, or we don't believe you, this is a one-on-one -on -one crime, and we're not going to prosecute. And I thought to myself, why not err on the side of the victim? Uh, if, if that's the case, and, and people come through this uh, trauma of being a victim, and sometimes getting beat up and killed, uh, that, that w why would you take a position with these people? They have to prove their, their legitimacy. It's like having to prove your innocence. There's got to be a better way to do this than what we're doing. Uh, isn't there a way to have a, uh, an agency within the office, at least if nothing else, show some kind of concern for victims and, and to let the, get the word out in the community that if, if you come to us and say, and you go through the police, and we gotta work with the police on this as well, but if you go to the police and say, I've been a victim of a, of a sexual assault, we gotta take your side until it's clearly clearly demonstrated that you're lying or that you're not telling. And, I, and, I, and that means I'm not making victims take lie detector tests, which is something that was moderately common back then. I thought, well, what an insult that is. I've come to you, I'm all beat up, I've been raped, and I've got to take a lie detector test to convince my prosecutor that I'm, a, that I'm a victim? Good God. I mean, how inhumane can that be? Annie was, um, was uh, and again, she's one of my assistants at this point, not a judge, said, I ran into a gal by the name of Debbie Anderson, who is uh, with the Rape Crisis Center, and you ought to get a you know, chance to talk with her sat down with Debbie, and Debbie's got more ideas than there are solutions. I mean, she, it was just marvelous. And I was really impressed, because we were talking on the same page of, what do you do with, with, with a rape victim? All this terrible trauma. We don't make anybody else go through it. You don't make a murder victim or their family go through this, but on one-on-one, -on -one, quote, one-on-one -on -one crime, it was, a, it was an office policy. And, and not because the office didn't care, just that they had everything, other things going. So it became pretty obvious to me somewhere along the line that we really had to get into some kind of a arrangement where we could have a separate effort in the office, proactive, not reactive, 
to try to get at the issue of, of sexual assault. I understand we've got to be we've got to be careful. You can't go out and just take everybody's word for it and proceed and bring defendants in and charge them. However, when there's any kind of reasonable basis to make a choice, let's err on the side of the of the victim. So so uh, everybody said that's great, good idea, fine, you know, run with it. So when when Debbie and I sort of hit it off, uh, and I thought there's got to be a way to come in and get some funding for her. I think we went through something called, at that point, LEAA, Legal, Legal Assistance, etc. I think it's no longer in existence, but it was a Lyndon Johnson uh, program at the time. And um, we, uh, we got some funding together to be able to, to promote a, uh, an executive director, I don't know, maybe eighteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, it wasn't a lot of money. But at least it set up an office, non-prosecutorial office in, in, in the deal. And, and Debbie brought in with her some of the ideas that she had through um, uh, her, the rape crisis stuff. And some of the stuff was just common sense uh, and, and uh, so logical that you sit back and say, how in God's name could we not have done this in the past? To, to taking a victim and saying, hey, we believe you, and here's the prosecutor. I'd like to have you meet her. Let's find a spot. We'll go out to your house and meet you. Uh, we'll talk with you. We'll talk to, 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 to tell that victim hey, we believe you, and we want to try to help you. Now, somewhere along the line, Debbie, Prosecutor X, or if you Prosecutor Y, could say this gal is goofy or lying or not doing, but, but anything that gave some element, and now my instructions were, if there's any doubt, err on the side of the, of the victim. We'll, we'll fight that thing through as we get motions and anything else. And Debbie um, was extremely good at going out interviewing anybody that was referred into the office. And then I would get involved uh, in talking about expanding the program, which is how we got into Illusion Theater. We thought the sexual assault thing was extremely important. So I started putting Debbie in charge of all this because she was so good. Uh, so she was in charge of the victim witness program, which again was, let's meet the victim, let's show them the human side of the office. We're not a bunch of bureaucrats. And, and, I, and I began to then to expand um, membership and, always, I, and I found sexist. I found that women related much better to victims than guys did. And so we started looking around for bright, you know, articulate uh, uh, female prosecutors that uh, when I came in there, there were, I think, three females out of the 60 some odd lawyers we had. And when I left, we, I think we had 20 to 25. It still, still wasn't what it ought to be. But, you know, with, with law school being what it was back in the 60s and 70s, you just weren't had a lot of females coming through the program, but I found that the uh, that the female prosecutors were just just as good as the guys were, but it had a whole separate look see uh, from from a victim standpoint, regardless if it was sexual assault or some other kind of a, of a situation. So I uh, that sort of played into my whole philosophy. After we got into the the sexual assault program through Debbie. I would say probably 75, 76, uh, halfway through in my first term. Uh, that's I think that's about the time I met with Cordy. And Debbie brought her in, along with June Fleeson, uh, and said, we want you to meet this girl. She's with something called the Illusion Theater. And it was pretty new at the time. And and uh, I, I, remember, I remember when, when I met with Cordy, uh, I was thinking, God, these women are absolutely, are, are so bright. I wish I had the time to, to get to, to be involved with them. Um, I wish it was my idea. Now, I'm going to claim credit for it, but I wish it were my idea. But I remember Cordy coming in with Debbie, and Debbie's terribly enthusiastic about saying, we've got this deal, it's Illusion Theater, it's this, this, and this, and this. It involves touching, it involves uh, physical contact, and I'm thinking to myself, where, where is this going? I mean, where, where does this all end? Because. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 my job is to prosecute and run an office of 75 to 80 lawyers. It ain't to become a social scientist. It's not how to go solve every problem known to man. But I'm fascinated by the fact that, that somebody's willing to take this to the next step and next level. And I, and I didn't know where the next level was going to be after that. But you, you're so impressed with what people are trying to do, and it's all volunteer effort. I mean, I don't think Cordy got a dime. But she she evolved. You worked right into our program, uh, and and saying, yeah, we got to move on this with with Illusion Theater, 
And so we just got started on it, and then I, I ended up not being reelected. But, but that was our, was our next step in dealing with it primarily with, you know, with young kids. My name is Deborah Anderson. I was in a consciousness raising group with a number of women, and it was our second consciousness raising. And we decided we would do something instead of just talk about it. And the wo a woman had been, Rita Gallagher is her name, and she had been to the first rape center in Washington, D.C. And we thought, we could do that. So we put together a few women and you know, got a phone. They gave us a room and the neighborhood counseling services on Hennepin Avenue. Um, and we thought we would get, you know, help people who had been raped. We made a connection with what was Mount Sinai Hospital at the time. And we, it was interesting because we didn't get calls from people who had been raped. We got a lot of calls from people who had been raped 5, 10, and 30 years ago and never told anybody. Then I was hired at the Hennepin County Attorney's Office on a grant to look at the issue of rape because we started the rape center. But the county attorney's office got that grant and a board member on neighborhood involvement program suggested to Gary Flackney that they talk with me and then I was hired um, part-time then full-time and we started to put together what was called the sexual assault services. I don't think there was another sexual assault services at the time. I, I could be wrong about that, but I do not think so. And what we did was put, there was an attorney, the hospital, and the police department, and connected those so that there was a system when somebody did experience a rape, if they went to the rape center, they then um, would call the police. The police would get them to the hospital for a medical evidentiary exam, and then that would create the evidence that was necessary for a uh, prosecution. You know, we became a team. There was um, a detective and Ann and Gary Peterson and just kept going until protocols and procedures were put in place, um, laws were changed. We really didn't have laws, particularly for kids. People started to report that we're 15, 19, 17, 15. And as that started to happen, um, then they were 12. And the issue itself, parents started to do something about it and the kids just were, got younger and younger. And in the first part of seeing kids, it was nothing we ever thought about. It, and there was all the old talk that they made it up. They fantasized about it. Um, and lots of that came from Freud's years of being harangued by his own colleagues by saying he was hearing this from. You know, and it's just taken a long time for this stuff to come out. Some of their st the things that happened to them were just, they were really hard to hear. And the making of a case was so hard. But after a point, if you could get kids in, a, in the um, courtroom and just say, t just tell the truth, just tell what happened. Kids were believed, plus for some kids there was medical evidentiary. Um, but there isn't a young child that wants to make anything up like that. You know, whether this is true or not, I felt like I was halfway being made fun of by a lot of the lawyers. You think it's everywhere. You, you know, you're looking for it. And then they started to question the touch, the actual touch. And we didn't even have laws in the very beginning to say which areas were an intimate part of your body. We had absolutely no language. So once those laws were created, 
of first, second, third, and fourth degree criminal sexual conduct. Then there was more language. It wasn't about patting somebody on the back. It wasn't about giving somebody a hug. But at the same time, a lot of people who did sexually abuse the kids were saying, I was just giving them a bath. I was just giving a little education. And um, I remember distinctly one child that was sexually abused, and she was not only sexually abused, but she was also really beaten in some ways. And he told the police, the stepfather, it was a spanking. And I remember her saying it wasn't a spanking, it was a beat up. You know, and you could just, you, you just could see and feel it. But that's actually would be a comment that would make a lot of fun of me about. <laughs> um, you, you can just feel it and see it. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll take that into court. We'll put you under like, court. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> So what is the difference between good touch and bad touch? And I remember distinctly where I was in the county attorney's office when some of that started to dawn on me. And that was how do we, you know, how do we prevent it? Who can get in this? And people told me to see you. I was walking around the court. Gary Flackney's office was here. For some reason, I was walking down that court corridor thinking and it, you know how those thoughts come and they're just like boom and it made sense I started talking about it and you could see the look on people's face yeah yeah instead of just kind of just getting on all the horrible touch because they knew that wasn't the full truth of it there was lots more and I, I remember talking to Cordelia Kent Anderson early on because I met her at a se seminar or education piece. And then we started brainstorming a lot more, how this would work, how, where we could go. And go, we went to see that. Actually, you know what happened? They came to the county attorney's office, Virginia mm -hmm. Binger and Russ Ewald, and sat in the conference room and talked. I, I don't think we even wrote anything up. I just, I can't remember. You know, n none of that grant writing. And they gave us the money. We just told them the story. We're seeing kids. We could prevent things. We need to look at this more. Um, the idea of extending something outside of that office function was a brand new thought. Because in the history of that office, it was attorneys, at that time called secretaries and investigators. And that's about the three roles that were present. Everyone. He said, um, you have to see this group, this illusion. You have to see them. Go t take this idea with the kids and good touch, bad, you know, touch to them, to, to, you know, talk to them. My entire memory is he referred me to you. Yeah. That's you my know, entire yeah, memory. Mine too. He's a pediatrician, yeah. and I think he saw kids who were injured. Um, and he was also very big into preventative medicine and public health. Um, and I think once, you know, just like you, once you o start opening this can up, you know, well, look at you two. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't quit in a way because you just realize the imp really how important it is to look at this for people. I mean, your very soul can be just damaged with this. It was with you. Mm -hmm. It was with when you, illusion, and you, you know, when we started talking, we could demonstrate this. It just became the perfect way to talk about it. Because we weren't pulling any children into it. It was adults and working with kids in demonstration, and it was art. It was absolutely a, an incredible way to go. And I, I, you know, from the way I remember it, it was, we were, it was just exciting. And I also think that you two had the total demeanor that didn't scare anybody. And that, um, and it was art. You know, it was, it had many different levels of 
education to it. And I think with some time, we just came about a fantastic way of showing it. It, it was really pretty phenomenal. You know, in the years, the months and years, it started to unroll. And I remember some Friday night watching some inane show with my kids. And they talked about good and bad touch. And I know that came from here. Because it was when it was just kind of doing that roll out in the country. And nobody had the language for it. And it w was that experiential. That's powerful. What you do. It was just kind of remarkable how it happened. Well, and then I think touch opened up the entire expansion of who were the offenders, even. Because, you know, we thought the offender was the person who jumped out of the bush, and it was minuscule. And then pretty soon it opened up everybody. I remember one, at one school where you presented, and there was um, a child that told afterwards that her dad was doing these things. And I just, I went with the detective and got the story and took her to the children's shelter. and. That was, this is so horrendous. <laughs> it's just so horrendous. One of the things I think you, you did was open this in such a broad way that if the county attorney's office did it, it never would have opened it ever the way your work opened it. If you don't have a language to talk about this, you can't write laws about it. You can't talk about it. Language conditions are thought about things. And the language was just critical. And they were very nervous about the idea that they're going to put everything, they're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They thought, we are not on the ground floor with this. And I think touch made it a lot easier for them to have this outside force really almost saying, we can look at this as a community. We're looking at it out here, which made it, s they weren't at such risk of being on the outer limb, because the, does that make sense to you? The community was doing it. Yeah. The collaboration and how we did this together, I think what happened is we made it safe for each other. Because you made it safe for the county attorney's office to look at this on a broader level. They made it safe for you being the authority. And it made it safe for the police. I mean, we created this sort of collective safety for this to happen, where none of us were out on a limb where we were going to just get it. Your openness and willingness to you know, look at this, because I could see a lot of other people kind of think, I'm not doing this. This isn't real theater work. And, but I also think you went a big mile by looking at their world and what like you said, going to the hospital and going to a case and, you know, listening to that so that there was this blending of worlds that made it better for everybody. Gary Flackney had been really interested in this issue and Deborah Anderson and had what been year interested did you in it. I started in 1977. So what I, my, they were established with that with adult uh, victims. The difference was to expand into dealing with children. And that was about the time there when I was there that they were s dealing with chemical dependency. And you remember that was a very early field then. And the whole issue of child sexual abuse as an issue coming up in that field was um, a struggle. Because you know, wait a minute, maybe you shouldn't bring that up, you should focus on the chemical dependency, and yet there was all these victims. 
And I was very fortunate, you know, to uh, land their program in human sexuality as an undergrad and get training as a small group leader. But when I left there, also very unusual for Minnesota, we had a legislatively mandated um, study that Correctional Service of Minnesota did, and I was hired as a research assistant. And then we were to study sex offender treatment across the country. There was a handful of places, and Minnesota happened to have uh, the Family Renewal Center. Do you remember Pat Carnes? Mm -hmm. But we also had Alpha House, um, which was and still remains um, a residential treatment program outpatient uh, for adults who have committed sex offenses. Uh, and it was a very unusual study to look at the treatment that was happening here and everywhere else and what we knew about uh, the question that still is asked, does treatment work? And who does it work for? And what kind of treatment do we need? Now, everybody knows the link between early abuse and trauma and incarceration later. And in fact, looking at that whole chain of abuse and trauma to foster care to institutionalization and correctional systems. But then, we really didn't. So the fact that we were seeing so many adult um, perpetrators who had histories as children, and you could debate whether that was truthful or not, but that knowledge wasn't there then. People weren't talking about it. So there's a lot of adult men talking about their histories of victimization, and there was a lot of women not eagerly talking about that. But that raised the issue of there's a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. And I say that because in the context of that era, child abuse and child maltreatment really focused on physical and emotional and neglect. Mm -hmm. And although sexual abuse was recognized as a form of that, it was the least talked about. And that's when I met Deborah Anderson, when I was working on those studies and doing that, and I said, there's a lot of kids, we should do a prevention program. And it's just good that we didn't know what we didn't know. I, it really is, because we had no idea, really, what that would involve or that there wasn't really models for us to look at anywhere. And then um, we got a grant from the McKnight Foundation for me to go to the county attorney's office and develop a child sexual abuse prevention program and be the person who was the child advocate there to do the help with the interviewing of children, and that was pre forensic interviewing, it was pre-Children's Advocacy Centers. The issue then uh, was that the court really didn't know how to deal with child witnesses. You're a witness. And how, are, how could we interview children in a way that would actually uh, allow them to tell their stories and not be re-traumatized? Um, that this wasn't how you could re respond to and prepare an adult victim, that it had to be different. Uh, at that time, one of the issues is they would be interviewed by so many different people mm -hmm. in the course of getting them ready. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole idea then that we didn't even realize was so radical was that we would have somebody who worked with the attorneys and helped prepare the child. That would just be child-centered and, and help and recognize that it was difficult for them. A lot of times children aren't believed and their credibility isn't believed. And in reality, there's a fair amount of documentation that if we're doing credible work with them, they can tell their stories and they can tell their stories very effectively. A, a very important pe thing for people to understand was to recognize that children didn't make this up. They couldn't make up the details. They couldn't make up this whole story. There's just no way it would have come to them. It wasn't in the news. It wasn't in the movies. They didn't have access to pornography. They didn't have, there was just no way they would have had the words. They would have had the descriptives. It was beyond their age and stage of comprehension. They were difficult cases, and mm -hmm. they still are. Yeah. So you've got, any time you've got one person's word against the other, mm -hmm. that's a challenging case. Absolutely. And add to that when that person is a child, that's a very challenging case. Mm -hmm. Add to that when you've got a perpetrator, uh, an alleged perpetrator who's a credible person, to this day it is difficult for people to hold those tru truths. How could this good person, mm -hmm. this whether that's a priest, whether that's a theater director, whether that's a boy scout leader, whether that's a business leader, a wonderful father, a wonderful coach, how could this person who does all of these good things also do that? it's hard for people to hold those two truths. Mm -hmm. And just the whole idea then that it could happen, that an adult really would 
sexually abuse, exploit a child uh, was very hard for people to grasp. We had done plays here that were using physical theater and we'd done a Furniturelli Flickers uh -huh. and Furniturelli Circus uh -huh. and we performed in all the libraries in Hennepin County <laughs> and a number of schools and when we came back to perform again they remembered everything that we did and they were physically remembering and mimicking what we'd done the year before and so then that made us go why are we doing something just silly little circus plays why don't we do something that might have more of mm -hmm. a lasting value for these kids so it was kind of a natural path of our own curiosity and desire to do something more meaningful mm -hmm. that then led us to the county attorney that was trying to do something that had more impact with kids and they weren't really looking for a theater company but we met a very innovative expert at the University of Minnesota on um, child neglect. Mm -hmm. It was called that then and he was a national and international speaker and we went to his lecture and he met us and he said I have someone you should meet and then we met Debbie Anderson who then led us to Gary Flackney and then they had just hired Cordelia and we all kind of just sat down and it seemed to make sense. I still remember our first discussions as foreign as that was child sexual abuse to you, mm -hmm. theater to me, it just made such sense, in part because you were so open to mm -hmm. it and so willing and so um, willing to embrace this topic that other people just weren't. Um, it was also very foreign to the county attorney's office. So not only were we pushing the limits of doing, uh, not just the preparing kids for court, that was challenging enough, but what was the county attorney's office doing, doing a prevention program of uh, me going to school, you know, spending time in the schools, educating kids and talking to parents and the public. You know, why were we doing all of that? Why were we working together uh, with a theater? Was challenging for people to understand until they saw the play. What do you remember about our, our, our sort of research process about, um, about preparing for I remember we had to um, just kind of think about all of our own personal experiences with touch, good and bad, and that that was, it was really revelatory and, and uh, interesting, and it, it, I think it really kind of brought us together as a company because um, we were kind of suddenly talking about really personal things. I mean, we kind of eased into it because I think we did all the good stuff first and, you know, then talked about things that were more difficult and, uh, but um, that was, that was really useful. And I, I remember we were taking in all of the swirl of information about sex, abuse, victimization, you know, um, hospitalization, you know, treatment, all these all these big words, <laughs> and trying to absorb it. So that meant right from the beginning, there was always this mix of the creative part that would be how we would interpret it, and then the real honest content. So it was this marriage from the beginning of a, us, which could communicate and talk to kids, and them who had all of the right content so that we weren't giving double messages, we weren't giving wrong messages. And then what I recollect is this afternoon, evening when we were over in our studio mm -hmm. and the sun went down yeah. and it got darker and darker and we started to tell more and more mm -hmm. as the darkness mm -hmm. came and we started to remember and tell things that I don't think we'd ever told anybody. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in a way, that to me is where the play came from. It mm -hmm. was the sort of revelations, as you yeah. said, of things that had happened to us that we had never ever said to anybody. Mm -hmm. And we were finding a way to talk about it yeah. for the first time. Had these sessions with Cordelia set up with all of these sort of experts and they would talk at us and felt like we were in school again. And then 
was also kind of heady and mm -hmm. somewhat overwhelming. Yeah. And then we had had, we had finished with a, in our studio with some women who were um, incest survivors. I think that was the last mm. thing we did, or we saw a film, or we talked about that. Yeah. Which was really, uh, I remember um, the feeling of it touching everybody emotionally so much, because they were really direct, and you saw these women who talked about their dads or their uncles. It was just like uh, hard for me to even imagine. And then we sat and talked a lot, and that to me is the moment when it felt like touch was created, because the sun was setting, and we had that great studio. Yeah. And got to be dusky where we could, you know, sort of see each other, but not quite. Yeah. And then everyone started remembering stories. Mm -hmm that you and I had said to each other, yeah, yeah, this is it, this is the play. <laughs> mm -hmm. This, you know, just people talking about these experiences, this is the play. It was so simple what we did. I mean, it's emotionally intense, but simplicity, there wasn't a lot to hide. There was no way to hide, you know, mm -hmm. that we've all done a lot of different other kinds of plays where there are ways you can mm -hmm hide behind language or the character or the costume or other people, but boy. Right. No, it was kind of just us. Yeah. <laughs> out there with the stuff. Boy, oof. There's certain ways you had to kind of right. trust that these yeah. people I was with, you know, would have my back. Right. Because we had to do that on mm -hmm. stage so many Yeah, times. it was very safe. It was so. very safe. What we always used to talk about then is, Look, when people say stay away from this dangerous stranger who's going to get you and you don't know what they're going to get, that's very scary. Uh, and in this way, it is focused on the behavior mm -hmm. and that that behavior is not okay. And you have rights to say no. You have rights to speak up about it. You have rights to question it. And the other thing we always did is we tried also to do perpetration prevention because we also parallel to that said you don't have a right to force or trick anyone into touch. No one has a right to force or trick you into touch. And that was more profound than we realized because, of course, now the full recognition is that prevention needs to focus on how do we prevent perpetration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that early part of saying, this is not okay to do, mm -hmm. like people were not clearly saying, it's not okay for an adult to sexually abuse a child. It's not okay for a peer to do that, you know, that you can't force, trick, or manipulate anyone else into touch. And in the early years, we never wanted people to be afraid of touch because they would equate all touch with sexual abuse. We wanted to be uh, very clear that touch was critically important to healthy development mm -hmm. and to thriving, mm -hmm. and to make sure that people <coughs> really didn't oversimplify the good and bad, but understood that nuance of confusing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But such an important message in touch was understanding if we're really committed to primary prevention, then we are promoting healthy relationships mm -hmm. and caring and knowing how to mm -hmm. touch. Yeah. Trust your feelings is just a, such an important message, you know, and, and not necessarily just around you know, sexual abuse situations or potential abuse situations, but just, you know, just to kind of get through life. <laughs> yeah, that would be yeah. Really. It's just made me more aware that mm -hmm. there's a lot that kids have to say and they'll, they will say it, but you just have yeah. to make sure they have to know that you're going to listen. Mm -hmm. And they have really good antenna about yeah. who's going to, you know, mm -hmm. should I talk or not, but mm -hmm. who's really listening. So you couldn't. Help me really be aware. You can't really fake that listening thing. You either are or you aren't. Yeah. You can't kind of pretend. I, the other thing I wanted to say that I did not realize was so radical when we did this. And and Bob Tenbensel, Robert Tenbensel, is who really taught us it was that I had no idea that saying to a child you have the right to say no was radical. Mm -hmm. I I didn't I just you know partly coming from our families mm -hmm. that was our birthright and you know so to me that was everybody's birthright and then to find out that so many children that are sexually abused didn't have the right to say no they couldn't say anything 
They were told to be silent. They were told, you know, they would be hurt. As soon as you started talking about this, uh, whether we were talking to a group of adults or a group of right. children, there was always somebody who had experienced it. That helped affirm that this was a very underreported problem. Mm -hmm. So for our critics who said you're making this bigger than it is, it doesn't really happen that often, all any of us who did that work in any way knew is, look, whenever we talk about this, there is somebody that says, yeah, that happened to me. Mm -hmm. So as much as ours was by design not meant to be something that was used only to uh, help people disclose, that was a reality that it did because there was so little available. We had to be prepared and I think the, the very unusual thing about our partnership is to bring together theater professionals and human service professionals in a meaningful partnership, not just uh, tangential, but in a meaningful partnership gave us a strength that I would have never had without you. Um, it was, you know, the program would have never been what it did without the theater. And I think having that content um, right. expertise was critical and, mm -hmm. high, and tr people trained to deal with the reality mm -hmm. of the disclosures and to do the professional training around it. Because the other part is we would have to do a lot of outreach to parents and training for professionals mm -hmm. in order to get to the kids. Mm -hmm. So being able to do workshops on dynamics of sexual abuse, how do you talk to children about it, how do you identify this, how do you deal with disclosures and reports, all of those workshops were another important part for people to say, okay, it's okay to educate our children. And also the thing we were up against was if you're doing all this prevention education, should we ethically be doing that when there are going to be disclosures and there are not enough treatment services or trained providers who know how to deal with it. And at the time, we knew, stay the course. We can't wait till all of these cases are identified in order to start prevention. Uh, we can't wait till we've got enough treatment services for those victimized and those who do the victimizing because it won't happen if we don't push the reality that this is really happening and there's no reason to wait till there's more harm to try to prevent it from happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. We went to Olympia, Washington for the National County Attorneys uh, Conference. That was uh, a showcase of what County Attorney's Office could do, but it was also breakthrough training for them to get them to understand, wait a minute, um, for those that knew there was a problem, there's a way to handle it. For those that didn't really know there was a problem, they knew there was a problem. And then being asked into the keynote of a major child abuse conference in LA opened up to multidisciplinary professionals um, from lawyers and police, uh, social workers, child welfare, therapists, uh, the very same things. Wait a minute, we've been starting to hear about this, or I think I've seen it, or oh, I missed it. <laughs> this is now what I know I'm dealing with, and this is how I can deal with it. What happened is we tapped into a, a need, a profound need, uh, in every single discipline because everyone has a role in prevention. So the faith community leaders were realizing people, they're seeing people and they needed to know how to help to them. The schools, of course, were seeing children. They needed to know how to not only educate them but how to deal with the uh, problems that got in the way of their learning based on the abuse that was happening. Uh, healthcare professionals, therapists, child welfare, uh, and um, law enforcement. And it took later to really understand, again, the dynamics fully of youth serving organizations beyond that, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the uh, after school, preschool programs. But anyone, uh, daycare, uh, preschool, anyone who cared for children, as well as parents. The reality is I would have never known the power of theater without this. I would have, I just wasn't my world. And to be there and have this together and have that uh, power of the audience discussion throughout the show and then after the show and being able to have that event that was so much more powerful than a speaker or even just a great curriculum. You know, you needed a lot more lessons, obviously. We all know the limits of a one-shot deal, as it's called. However, this was a catalytic event. 
at a time when this just wasn't talked about. So we were just changing a social norm by talking about it, uh, by modeling how to talk about it, and to having matter-of-fact discussions. I, the, the power of theater to be a catalyst for that social change and for that discussion can't be underestimated. And again, I think bringing together our professions so that we had, had uh, really rock solid information and could deal with those people standing afterwards mm -hmm. who wanted to talk, could offer the professional training to augment it. It was radical and we didn't even <laughs> know it. <laughs> And I think what we learned was we've all been a kid. So that was the beauty of the piece as a training for adults that they had never talked about this and they could remember they were kids. I think what, about sense. seeing it was really that it did create a language. It did create a way to talk about this. It gave them a way to understand the dynamics of child sexual abuse, but it also made a topic that was incredibly threatening, non-threatening. I think when we created this, I thought, I, re I, re I really did think that in 10 years there'd be no sexual abuse of children anymore. <laughs> I really did. I thought, well, we went all over the world, mm -hmm. I mean, the country. We were in so many mm -hmm. different places performing sure. this. And, and I thought, well, we've got the word out. We're, put, we're doing all this training mm -hmm. of teachers, of judges, of lawyers, of medical personnel, you know, of families. And everywhere we're going, that means that kids will say no. Kids will tell somebody. They'll keep telling until they tell somebody who mm -hmm. believes them. You know, all mm -hmm. the messages. And I just thought it would happen.